thank you once again for the opportunity of preaching today. Uh, this is the second in what I hope, Lord willing, will be a series on the minor prophets. I thought I'd call it Majoring on the Minors. Uh, last time we looked at the book of Habakkuk. Now, he's an interesting guy, and if you missed it, um, you missed something fascinating because he's, a, he's a, a prophet who never preached a sermon. Habakkuk never preached. The book of Habakkuk is in fact just a, a dialogue between him and God and a prayer at the end. Habakkuk was a, uh, a, a sensitive, cultured man. We believe he may have been one of the Levites who, who sang in the temple and, and directed music. So his interests were theology, music, poetry. By contrast, we now have a look at Amos between Habakkuk and Amos. So before we go any further, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you might open your word to us, instruct us, teach us, Lord. Show us the mighty and wonderful things you have in your word for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, indeed, turn to the book of Habakkuk, uh, book of Amos. Amos 1.1. 1, 1. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen at Tekoa. Where's Tekoa? Anyone ever been to Tekoa? I doubt it. Tekoa... The district is south and the east of Jerusalem. You go sort of south and east, heading towards the Dead Sea. Tekoa is right on the edge of the land you could cultivate. Okay? So valleys... There was some decent soil and they would grow things in there. And the rest of the land was just uh, grazing country, was right on that edge. And what they did was they planted in the valleys, in the good soil. They didn't plant annual crops like wheat or barley. They planted trees, the sycamore fig trees. We find later that Amos's job was a herdsman, probably a shepherd, and a tender of a guy who looked after the sycamore fig trees. Now, it's not a flash job. And it's, it's not a job that requires a, so to speak, universe on the job. It's the, the people of Tekoa, they had a reputation. Actually, it was a good one. For we find in 2 Samuel 14 that there were wise people in Tekoa and that a wise woman of Tekoa gave advice to King David. Yeah. We also find in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 5, that Tekoa were hard workers. When the rebuilding was happening in Jerusalem, the people of Tekoa apparently moved from where they were living at Tekoa and moved into Jerusalem. And that they were hard workers rebuilding the wall, but there was a problem. Their rulers, their nobles, were lazy, we find in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 27. So they were good, hard, uh, it was in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Hmm. Uzziah, king of Judah. Well, you find in the book of Isaiah that the great vision of Isaiah occurred the year that King Uzziah died. Uh -huh. So we know that Amos lived just before the period of Isaiah. And he was during the time of Jeroboam. Now, you've got to remember there's two Jeroboams. 
This is King Jeroboam II. Okay. They were a bit like, you know, the English with their kings. They reused Elizabeth II. But nobody ever refers to her as Elizabeth II. She's just Queen Elizabeth, you see. So this was Jeroboam II, but no one ever called him that. He was just King Jeroboam. So when does that put us? Puts us around about 825, 820 BC. That's around about the time we're, we're, we're looking at. You've got to sort of get the idea here. I think the initial reaction was a, a little bit like with John the Baptist. Here's this guy just comes out of the wilderness of Tekoa, grisly good. You see, what he says was, in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 3, Thus say the expressions of Damascus, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof. What? He's preaching against Damascus. He's giving a hard time to the Syrians. Go on it. Do it. Go, Amos. Yeah, this is really great. And then we look down and it says, For thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Hey, hey the Philistines. Good one, Amos. Hey, you know, people would be loving this. Here's Amos saying those rotten Syrians and those rotten looking uh, Philistines, God's going to judge them. And you can just see the inhabitants of Israel and Judah going, you know, mate, have you ever looked and just sat there and gone, oh, you know, just really give it to them. You know, the, the people of Israel and Judah, they were loving this. And, and the in chapter 1, verse 11, he says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. The Edomites, is there nobody this guy won't have a crack? He's after the Syrians, the Philistians, the Edomites. Inci incidentally, you notice the formula he uses? For three and for four? For three? It's an old Hebrew way of doing things. It's interesting that it's, it's an older way of doing it. They may be ones that have been passed down. The other place we find it is in the book of Job. Yeah, Job. Yeah, there's, there's Job doing it. Um, and, and he says... For six, yea, for seven. 19, you can have a look at that if you want to. For Job uses the same expression. For six, yea, for seven. So, and Job's an old, old book. So this is an old way of talking about things. And it's interesting, you know, sometimes people in out-of-the-way places, they preserve old ways of speaking. You you go into, you know, the, the little village, and this was a, apparently in Tekoa too, this little out of the way spot, just a bunch of farmers, herdsmen and fruit pickers. And they had this way of putting things. So he's in, in one three, he's had a crack at the Syrians. In one six, he's pronounced doom upon the Philip, the Ammonites. Oh, it's about time someone got into them. It's about time God dealt with the Ammonites. And they're sitting there going, yeah, we're going to have to come back next Sunday to hear this guy preach again. This is just so great. Then, in chapter 2, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four I will not turn the way the punishment thereof. Now, if you know your geography, you know, think about the map of Israel. Syria's up there, Edom's down there, Moab's over there, Philistine's over there, and the Ammonites are over there. Yep. Everybody, he's done the complete circuit. He said, 
You're all a bunch of rotten, wicked sinners. And all the people in Israel and Judah said, Amen. Isn't that great? And they sat back and said, What else has he got to say? And then in verse sessions of Judah and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof what Judah now remember he's he's preaching in Israel he's preaching in the northern kingdom and and, and they're going Judah well okay I mean they're our cousins they you know they're, they're not that bad they're a bit bit harsh there Amos but I guess so, you know, I can, we can handle that. And then in verse 6, chapter 2, Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not turn away the punishment of, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes, he said. You people, you called out, to God for justice. Guess what? He's going to do it. And the people of Israel went, hang on, whoa, 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 you know, time out here. Just 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 hold your horses, Amos. Don't get so so busy there because we called out for justice, but we called out for justice on them, not on us. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. Remember what, ever seen the, the, the picture of, or the picture of a statue of justice? It's got a blindfold on. Blind. Deliberately blind. Because it doesn't matter who comes in front of it. You see, so often, we as Christians, we look at the world and we say, why doesn't God do something about this? We may look at the political world and say, why doesn't God do something about the rotten, evil, just treacherous, um, corrupt and we look at them and we say, they are so deserving of judgment. And, they, and you're right, they are. Or we may look at a religion, at the religions around us, and we say, the evil that is perpetrated in God's name today by, by people who are financially corrupt, who are morally corrupt, who are theologically corrupt, People who have no right to judge them. You should. But you see, there's a problem. And the problem is found in the book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 4. We think, why doesn't God do so? Time is come that judgment must begin and if it truly begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If God's going to judge, will he not judge his own people first before dealing with the rest of the world? Mm. Oh, I, I get very nervous when people call on God for justice. In fact, let me tell you, if you are going to pray for, uh, for justice from God and I'm sitting next to you, will you give me some warning? Because I want to move a bit away from you just in case God delivers it right now. Okay? I, I don't want to be sitting next to some Christians when God starts delivering justice. Mercy. Mercy on us and mercy on them. 
God's people called for justice against the sinners that were around them and around them. So much time, so often we've got this thing round backwards that we call on God for justice and not for mercy. And don't think that we haven't been warned. For in Amos chapter 3, it says, Of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a, ro a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he has nothing? taken nothing, can upon the earth where there is no gin for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Now he gets to the point. He says, shall a trumpet be blown in the city and people not be afraid? Yeah, think about it. Over in Ukraine now, when the air raid signs start wailing, are not the people afraid? Have they not been? But he reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared. Who will not fear? He's, Amos is saying, people, it's not as if you weren't warned. God rose up early sending you judges and prophets and preachers and you didn't listen. You think, yeah, but, you know, we're, we're in church. We, we hear the word of God every Sunday, every Wednesday. It's all there for us. Now, there's, a, there's a little problem with that too. And that problem is found in the book of Luke. Luke, chapter 12. In the book of Luke, chapter 12, Verse 48. The end part of, part of verse 48 of Luke chapter 12. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed us the more. Yeah. You've been in a great privilege. We all have. We've all been in this privilege of hearing the word of God. Don't you think that means God will require that much more out of us? If we have been warned of the danger of sin so many times, and yet we still fall into it, don't you? You were in church, and you tuned out from the preacher and went to that little happy place in your head so you didn't have to listen to what he was saying. Every time God called you to do something and you ignored it and left off. Every time the word of God entered your heart, but you hardened it so it would not have any effect, it became more liable for what you didn't do. You've been, been warned. And yet, we don't listen. We don't respond. By now, the people in Amos's time, they're starting to get a bit just criticizing all the other people. You know, it, it, if, if a, a preacher gets up here and he begins to criticize the, the Scientologists, well, there's a lot wrong with them. And he begins to criticize the Jehovah's Witnesses, and there's plenty wrong with them. And he begins to criticize the, the Catholic Church, and there's plenty wrong there. And while he's busy criticizing other religions, you go, yeah, yeah, I'm right. And then on the Baptists, you go, oh, hang on, that's a bit harsh. Mm hmm. Your worship won't help. Verse 4. 
She has come to Bethel and transgress, and at Gilgal multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, and your tithes after three years. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven, and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this liketh you, O ye children of Israel. You see, Amos really upset. First Kings chapter 12. Let's turn over to First Kings chapter 12. Verse 25. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25. And it's interesting here. Because then Jeroboam built Shechem. This isn't the same Jeroboam. This is Jeroboam the first. Okay? Now let's, let's you know, this is years and years earlier. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein, went out from thence and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now should, if these people do do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto King Rehoboam, king of Judah. They shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel. Give me some advice, fellas, he said. And made two calves of gold and said unto them, to the people, it's too much to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Ethel. Now, the putting one at Bethel, that's a... Bethel was an old and honourable site of worship. People had worshipped at Bethel right back to the time of Jacob. He put a golden calf there and he said, it's too hard all the way to, to Jerusalem to worship. Yeah, it's too hard to get up on a Sunday morning and come to church. It's too hard. Why don't you come and do it the easy way? And he said, I'm not bringing in a new God. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't get me wrong here. It's not a new God. This golden calf, this is just a symbol of the God that brought you up out of Egypt. See, what, what he was doing, he wasn't breaking the first commandment. He was breaking the second. He wasn't bringing in a new God. He was saying, no, this is just a representation of your God, O Israel. There he is, a nice, easy representation of it. So you can, you know, it's such a long way to Jerusalem. And after all, Aren't we all worshipping the same judgmental? Don't be so bigoted. Don't be so harsh and just worship with us at Gilgal and Bethel. Now, it's possible that the first generation who went to worship there were worshipping the God of Israel in the wrong way. But they were saying, yeah, this is the God that brought us up. And so this be became a place of sin to Israel. And Amos says, I, I don't, you know, you're going to, to, uh, to worship there. You're going to come to Gilgal and you're going to do all the right things. You're going to offer your sacrifices. You're going to bring in your tithes but you're doing it wrong because you're in the wrong place worshipping the wrong God and it's not going to help. Verse 11 of chapter 4, it says, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. God was trying to get their attention. But they weren't listening. Now, this, this concept of a brand plucked out of the fire. If you've ever been in a campfire and you pull a stick out and it's burning, how do you, how do you stop it burning? 
you can stick it in water or something. But you know the simplest way to do it? Is you beat it on the ground for a while and it knocks the fire out of it. It works. Now that's what God had done to some of these people. He'd pulled them out of the fire and he'd beaten them on the ground for a while, but they still weren't listening. You were as a bland, br firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. They are scary, scary words. He's saying, prepare to meet thy God, and yet they still didn't, he, they still weren't paying attention to God. Now there's a, there's a story about a young man in the southern states of America who wanted to learn how to plow with a mule, which is quite a knack. And so he asked, who's the best plowman around? And they said, oh, I'll, I'll, you know, old so-and-so down there on that hollow, he's, he's really good. You look at his paddocks, the furrows are dead straight and they're in line and they're pl plowed just beautifully. He is the best plowman around and he and that old mule just do brilliant work. So the young fellow said, that's the man I want to learn from. Wise lad. So he goes down to the the man's farm, and sure enough, there's the old farmer and the mule hitched up to a plough, ready to start ploughing. And and he uh, he says to the farmer, look, I, I want to learn. I want to learn from the best. And they say, you're the best ploughman there is. So can I watch and see how you do it? And the farmer said, yeah, of course you can. But I'll tell you, there's a little knack. There's a little trick to it. Really? So the farmer goes over to where the fence is and he picks up this piece of a fence post. It's about that long. And he walks up to the mule and he goes, what? Across the head of the mule. And the mule goes, oh. And, and the, the, the young fellow says, what did you do that for? The mule hasn't done anything yet. He says, I know he hasn't done anything. That was just to get his attention. Are we like that sometimes? How many times does God have to hit us over the head before he gets our attention? Uh, you know, I, I, I pride myself that usually God only has to hit me two or three times before I notice. You know, I, 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 you know it's one last chance. One last chance. God is giving these people, he's sending them Amos. Can a man make it any plainer than Amos has? And yet, they will not listen. So, in Amos chapter 5, Amos chapter 5, verse 4, he says, for thus saith the Lord unto Israel, Seek me, seek ye me, and ye shall live. But seek not to enter Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal, and pass not to be a sheep, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Seek ye the Lord, and ye shall live, lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph and devour it and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Well, he says, seek the Lord while you have a chance because it's coming to a time when it's going to be too late. So, One last chance. But over in chapter 7, we find the reaction of the religious people of his day. Amos chapter 7, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, 
Remember, he's been saying, don't go to Bethel. Don't go to Bethel. It's no point going to Bethel. That golden calf won't save you. Bringing your sacrifices to Bethel won't save you. The religion of Bethel is not going to help. Well, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Wow. He must got noticed for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, Amos got noticed by the, uh, the religious leaders of the community. And they didn't like it. Was it jealousy? Was it bitterness? Did they understand perhaps that, you know, Amos was right and they were wrong, but they couldn't bring themselves to admit it? For thus saith, verse 11, For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. You know, go away. Go, go somewhere else and preach. You want to preach? Go somewhere else and do it. Don't do it here. But prophesy not again any more in Bethel, for it's the king's chapel, it's the king's court. Amos, you're not welcome here. How many times have a preacher preached the word of God in a church and been told, you're not welcome here because what you're saying doesn't fit with what we're doing and what we're believing. The reaction to Amos's preaching. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, rather was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. You're calling me preacher? You're calling me a seer? You're saying, go and preach somewhere else, New Zealand. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. Now, we have at least one here who can't say that because they are the son of a prophet, the son of a preacher. But he's saying, what he's getting at is he's saying, look, I'm not a professional at this. God's just told me this is what you have to say and I'm saying it. What do I do for a living? I'm a herds, I'm a shepherd, I'm a gatherer of sycamore fruit, of sycamore figs. You know, does God use people like that? Oh yeah. You know those sycamore trees? It's a very famous one in Jericho. It was a sycamore fig that Zacchaeus climbed up to see the Lord Jesus. He said, I'm just a herdsman. What does a shepherd know? David was a shepherd. He knew a bit. Moses was a shepherd. He knew a bit. The very first those people who were told of the birth of the Saviour were shepherds. So if someone says, I'm just a shepherd, and I look after sycamore figs. God says you are eminently qualified to be a prophet because you become a prophet not by training, not by education, although they're good. I mean, they established schools of the prophets to teach people to preach. But you become a prophet and a preacher by the calling of God. Verse 15, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock and the Lord said unto me, go prophesy unto my people Israel. You are not placed as a pastor of a church by the vote of the congregation. Did you know that? You are placed as the pastor of a church by the appointment of Almighty God. The congregation 
Just recognize it. God calls certain people to preach. And they can't do anything else. They can never be happy doing anything else. They simply go, I have to preach. <laughs> and if people listen, great. If people don't, I just still have to preach. So he says to this man, this, this priest, in verse 15, God took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. He says, I've got a message for you, priest. The guy in charge of the the prop the 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 worship at Gilgal, I've got a message to you from God, just for you. Verse seventeen. Therefore, thus saith the Lord: Thy wife shall be a harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land. Whoa! This guy came and he said, Amos, don't don't preach any more here. Go somewhere else and preach. And Amos said, I've got a message for you. Your wife will be reduced to selling herself in the streets. Your sons and your daughters will be killed in front of you and you will die in a foreign country. There you go. There's your message from God. And Israel shall surely go forth into captivity of his land. Why doesn't God give us justice? Because we wouldn't like it. And then sometimes he does. You see, those people didn't want to hear Amos's message. They really didn't. They were happy when he was talking about other countries and other religions. They were happy when he was giving them a hard time. But when he came to exposing the sin of God's people, they said, we don't want to hear it. Do you know that God sometimes does give you what you ask for? Because they said, we don't want to hear you, Amos. So in, verse, in chapter 11, sorry, in verse 11 of chapter 8 of Amos, Amos 8, 11, Amos says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of God. And they shall wander from sea to sea, from the north to the east, and shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. You didn't want to listen to God's word? Fine, he'll take it away from you. Never in the history of mankind has God's word been so available and so little read? What people don't realize is they ask things of God and they do not realize what they're asking for. They say to God, I don't want your presence. And so he will say to them, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. They don't want his light. And he, will, he who dwells in light unapproachable will send them into darkness. They don't want his law and all that will be left is lawlessness. They don't want his love and all that will be left is hatred. They don't want his comfort and all that will be left is disgrace and despair. They don't want his forgiveness and all that will be left is his judgment. You see, people who have turned their back on God and say, I don't want to have anything to do with him, one day he'll say, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you it. 
And there'll be a time when he will say, prepare to meet thy God. And when they do, there will be no light, no love, no comfort, no care, no mercy, no forgiveness. And it's exactly what they wanted. But they won't enjoy it. They won't like it. Because he will give them that for all eternity. Away from him. Amos, the preacher who said one last chance. The preacher who said justice is coming and you won't like it. The preacher who said prepare to meet thy God. But he's also the preacher who said I will not utterly destroy. Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9, verse 8. Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. He said, yeah, there's judgment coming, but I'm not going to utterly destroy you. I will save some. Some. For lo, I will command and I do sift the house of Israel among all nations like corn is sifted in a sieve. Now, they beat the wheat, beat the grain, and they'd throw it up in the air and the chaff would be blown away. The problem when you beat grain, especially upon a rock, is you get little bits of rock in there. So they would take the grain and they'd put it in a sieve. They'd shake it. And the broken bits would fall out the bottom and the dust would fall out the bottom. And then they'd pick the bits of rock out. Because when you make rock cakes, you really don't want to make any real rocks. Right? And they'd pick the bits of rock out and there was the grain ready to be poured into storage. And God is saying with his people, he's going to scoop them up and he's going to shake them in the sieve. And the broken ones will fall out the bottom and be swept away. And the little bits of rock in there will be pulled out. But not are secure. They're safe. And though they be sifted in a sieve, not one grain of them will be lost. In fact, the, the last portion of Amos is quoted by James in Acts 15. Yeah. Amos gets a quote in the New Testament. In Acts 15, verses 14 to 17, we have Amos 9, 11 quoted. Let's just see what James says about it. James 15, James answered saying, Men and brothers to take out a people of them for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. Here he begins to quote Amos. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down and I will build up the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called saith the Lord who, do, who doeth these things. Yeah, Amos gets in Acts 15. We look back in, in Amos 9.11. In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. Yeah, that's it. That's the bit. And close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they possessed the remnant of Edom and all of the heathen which are called by my name. Yeah. All of the nations, all of the Gentiles which are called by my name. You know who that is? That's us. Amos says there's going to come a time when I will build up not only the house of Israel and I will restore it and replenish it and, and put it back together again, but I'm going to collect out of the Gentiles a people for me. That's us. That's us there. There in, 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 in 
Amos chapter 9, verse 12, all of the heathen which are called by my name. Yeah, we get a mention. The hills shall melt and I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof and they shall make gardens and eat upon their land and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. There's a future coming for God's people, a special future. He says, and this is an interesting one, the plowman shall overtake the reaper. All right. up plowing, putting in the next crop and he's treading on your heels. The land is so fertile, you've got barely time to cut one crop before the next one's coming up. You know, so I sympathy with Amos in some ways. Because I'm not a prophet. <laughs> I'm not a prophet's son. I was going to agricultural college and I fully intended to work in agriculture and grow stuff and do that sort of thing. But God called me and said, go preach. I went, okay. But I can tell you, I still heavy laden and I will give you rest. He says, I'll pluck you like a brand out of the burning. I'll pick you like a grain of wheat out of a sieve and I will preserve you. If you will come to me, if you will realize that what you need is not justice, but mercy, willing to receive his mercy this day, it is waiting for you. Will you receive it? Will you take it? Or will you ignore it and say, go preach somewhere else? Oh, thank goodness he's almost over. I only have to put up with this for a few more minutes. I can, I can ignore it for a little while more. And God's spirit is saying, lost, I have, I'll call. After that, no more. After that, you'll get the justice you called for and you won't enjoy it. Are you willing to call now for mercy upon the God of mercy, the God of Amos, who warned those people Thank you, Brother Alan, for that uh, wonderful message and the challenge to all of us. If you're here this morning and you don't know whether you are living in the grace of God or in Christ or you're not sure that you are one of those brands that has been plucked and want is to leave this place and then it may be your last and you find yourself having to answer for your own sins before the God of justice. And for those of us who are walking in the Lord, those of us who have been saved, remember the Bible tells us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. To always humble ourselves because in that, it's in that humble state that we continue to ask for mercy and for justice and we don't put ourselves above the Word of God of all things and it's always trying to put us over the Word of God. So if it says something, the heart will find a reason not to follow it. So let's not be like Jeroboam. Let's not be like the, the kings of Israel who replaced God with a golden calf. And then made an excuse about it as well. Just please, um, uh, we're here for you. Um, we'd love to uh, pray with you and share the word of God with you and, and to help you in any way we can. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord. How firm a foundation, 268 in your hymn books this morning. And that first verse says, What more can he say than to you he has said? You've heard it all this morning. So these are the words that we sing. Oh, oh.